Hello, Jeff Nash family. I hope you're having a great weekend. And uh, I just wanted to start off the service real quick just to let you know that as a leadership team, we have met and we've looked at um, quite a few different things and we have made the decision based on approval of a plan by our mayor and our health officials that we will be coming back together to meet inside of the four walls of the church starting on the weekend of May 31st for the Saturday services and the Sunday services. Now let me tell you, we're calling it a new reality plan because this isn't just going back to a new normal. We don't even know what that is. We live in a society that's different right now. It's a new reality. So there's going to be social distancing restrictions. There's going to be uh, max capacities in each one of our rooms. But we're going to open up the sanctuary here in the fireside as well as in the gym so that we can meet and, and have plenty of people come and worship as well as two services offered on Sundays at 9 and 1045. So more information is coming. I'm sure there's lots of questions. You're getting a letter from me in the mail that's going out today as we record this on Friday. So you should have it the first of the week. Um, look at that. Read through it. And then if you have any questions, just email the NAS at jeffnaz.org and we'll try to answer those the best that we can. I look forward to coming together, even in a new reality, but being able to come within the four walls once again.
Thank you for joining us in worship. Let's begin with just a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for what you are doing in your church, the body of Christ, that during this time, while we've not been able to meet within the four walls, that we have still had countless examples of people going out, going out in missions, reaching out to their neighbors in ways that they never had before, taking meals, making masks, taking all kinds of different stuff, groceries, and providing, helping us as a church to be able to provide needs for many people. And God, I just thank you. I thank you how many have just not missed a beat. But Lord, we also do anticipate that time of being able to come back together. And it's going to be different. It's a brand new reality. So Lord, I I just pray that you will prepare us for that. And prepare us to more and more to grow to be like your son. More loving and more lovable. More filled with wisdom, courage, and compassion to do what you've called us to do. In the name of your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, imagine with me, if you will, that it's 100 A.D. It's so 100 A.D. and you're living in a city that, according to legend, was founded by a, a tribe of Amazons, a, a tribe of female warriors from the uh, Amazonians. And now some of you might think that I'm beginning to tell the backstory of a Wonder Woman comic, okay? Because you know my wife loves Wonder Woman and so do my daughters and all my kids. But, but guess what? It's a biblical city. It, it was the city of Ephesus. Yeah, the city to whom Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. So let's get back on track. We're 100 AD in Ephesus, and it's a city that's been ruled by the Roman Empire for about 200 years at this point, and in fact is considered the fourth greatest city in the world, next to Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch of Syria. It's a city of trade, bustling with activity every day, And you moved there. You probably moved there because, well, I mean, you're a foreigner to the area, but you moved there because of a dream of commerce, of being able to get rich selling all of your wares. And while there, though, you met this group of people. And, well, they're merchants kind of like yourself, but they're an interesting group of people. You see, when they get together, they don't just spend all their time talking about the normal, here's what I'm selling, what are you selling? Hey, guess what my mock-ups are and my ROI and all those things if you're into business. And, you know, they're not just talking about that. They're talking about this Jesus, this guy by the name of Jesus, and you're intrigued by it. You want to know more, and you begin to get together with them, sharing meals, hanging out over dinner and conversations, hearing stories being told about healings and miracles that this man Jesus did, how he died and he rose again. So very unique. You know, there isn't a single person in this group who takes a lead role. In fact, they all kind of share stories. Even the the pagan temples have a head priest or a head sorcerer, but they all are doing life together. They're all going out and being examples in their city. And you're just more and more intrigued. Some of them begin to tell stories about being there when the disciples, they talk about the Holy Spirit coming on them and flames of tongue and they came out and they they spoke and everyone heard them in their own languages. And it just created this new kind of fire in their own lives. And initially you have to admit that you kind of thought, well, this is some type of sorcery, but I mean, at least it's a good kind of sorcery. And today... You're excited because you've heard that messengers from a man named Paul have arrived and they have a story for you. They have tales of what you need to do, what it looks like for you as a church, as an individual who calls yourself part of the way. Can you picture that? They had nothing to measure their faith by. No theological training, no background in Christian history or the church to help guide them. All they knew was Jesus and the result that He had in the lives of a handful of a ragtag group from Galilee. And yet they were impassioned to go. They were eager to hear more from Paul. And Paul gives them some insights into how they were made for more. They were made to be more and do more. All those things we've been talking about. Made to take care of what was in front of them. And Paul writes to them and shares all the keys to what it means to allow Christ to fill you, to use you, and to equip you. But then, what do we do with it? What do we do with it? 
Well, Jesus told us we're to go into all the world. We're called to go. And now it's a tricky word. So we want to talk about that some today and what keeps us from going. We've talked about being more, doing more, but we still sometimes just can't go. You know, the word used uh, often has this idea and this picture when Jesus gave uh, the, the great commission to go into all the world. It gave this picture of as you are going. As you are going about life. When you're in the grocery store, the way you respond when you are stuck in a line and the person in front of you has 73 coupons, they have, well, this credit card's not working and that one's not. And so instead of seeing the person who maybe is a little down on their luck and could use some help, you're frustrated because of your time and the inconvenience. Because after all, time is money and that's ingrained into our head. So don't waste my time. So how do we go? You know, there's a couple things as a church that I believe that the New Testament and other places teaches us. There are warnings for us. So there are warnings for us as a believer. Two key warnings that we must keep in mind as we go. First is the warning to don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 8, tells us this, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Jumping to verse 14, For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper! Rise from the dead and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do you know we have an enemy who tries to keep us asleep it's a strange state of being you're seeing things but you're asleep you see the poverty around you but you're inconvenienced by it you see the hurting and the broken but they they're just they're an inconvenience you're not a professional and so you sleep is it any wonder i think about depression and when you're depressed if you've ever been there even for a short time maybe not clinically depressed but you you just want to sleep you just want to shut all your cares and worries away and so you sleep is it any wonder that's the picture that's given to us satan seeks to bring about a spiritual depression in our lives just to make us sleep so can i be honest i think sometimes that sleep is caused because of too much exposure to religion to religion. Now, now, before you shut off the video and tune me out, let me explain. I, I'm not saying we're not made to fellowship together. I am looking forward to meeting again inside these four walls just like the rest of you, okay? Um, but we are not defined by our building. Sometimes we can spend so much time sitting and learning that we don't ever go. We sit and we learn. We, we can be so involved in church inside the four walls, but yet we're asleep to the world that's around us and the cares and concerns. Our passion for Jesus and to tell others has been deadened, well, because, well, I don't, I don't know enough yet. And I, I, don't, I don't know all the theological terms and answers. And so we can be sleepwalking, sleep-talking, and even sleep-churching and not even know it. When we are sleep-churching the mystery of God that we're supposed to be stewards <laughs> remains a mystery to the people around us because they don't see it. They don't see it. They don't see a difference. But before you feel like I'm beating you up or blaming a specific generation, let me point to a problem that this problem has been around. The sleeping has been around a long time. Mark chapter 14, verse 32 tells us a story of sleeping in the Bible. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. And then he took the three, Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death, so stay here and keep watch with me. And he went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and he found the disciples asleep. 
he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The disciples, even the three beloved, the closest to Jesus, fell asleep on Him when He needed them the most. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Today, we in our society and as believers can get consumed by the tiniest, most insignificant things that we don't that they don't even really matter in the grand scheme of things, yet the world around us is forgotten. We forget the hurting. We forget the lost. We forget the poor. We begin worrying so much and get caught up in a time like this about whether the government has the right to take away whatever they're doing or whether this pandemic is some type of conspiracy or a hoax. And there are people on all ends of that spectrum inside of our church and we begin to lack compassion for them in doing so in doing and getting caught in any one end of that spectrum we do so missing that our neighbors are hungry or fearful or without a job or or we miss the fact that someone we know has lost a loved one and can't even have a funeral We say things like, well, they were old and had a pre-condition, pre-existing condition anyway, so whatever. We've lost our compassion. And as a church, we are called to show wisdom, courage, and compassion, even in the tough times surrounding us. I was reminded, you know, we like to often point to the end times and to revelations, and I'm not here to do a sermon on whether this is the end times and the tribulation or not, but revelations, I think, was very fitting in chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says, write this, write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive. But you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly, as suddenly as a thief. You see, we need to make a couple huge shifts when it comes to following Christ. Shift number one is we need to move from more programs to more mission fields. We often think that a new program in the church, and I mean, little caveat, how many times I have people come to me and say, you know, Pastor, the church ought to be doing this. Why don't you start it? And my response is, hey, that's a great one for you to start. But we often want the church to do all the programs when we are the body of Christ. This four-wall building is not the church. It's the place where we come together to learn to be the church and to go out and be the hands and feet of Christ, the body of Christ, the church. We need to see the world as our mission field. In other words, we don't need more church programs. Alan Hirsch and Michael Frost, they, they do a lot of research in the decline of the church, among other authors. And in one study, they take a look at the church in England. There are countless beautiful buildings, cathedrals, monuments that are empty. The rise of atheism in what was, one, what was once the key countries and the center for the church is astonishing. When you trace it back, it often falls with them forgetting that they were to be a light in their communities. That they were to be for the villages they were in. Historically, a church would come into the center of a city, set up shop, and people would flood into them. But that's not the case today. That's not the case. Often people see the church as antiquated or more of just a social club. They don't see it as a place where they're welcome into They don't see a healthy family. They see examples of churches running off pastors and church splits and all sorts of unhealth. They don't see the church as being influential or a part of their local community. Standing up to meet the needs 
of their village in a time of crisis. Can I again just say thank you, church. Many of you have been standing up and being the church, not for the name of the Jeff Naz Church or the Nazarene Church, but in the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom. So thank you. I cannot thank you enough. It does me pri- uh, pr- gives me pride in our, our church to see that. But we must continue to be a church that's for Jefferson, that our heart is broken for our village We must live and breathe the motto of being for our village. We need to go more. And where do we go? You know, Jesus has already placed you in your mission field. Your mission is where you live, work, study, and play. That's your mission field. Where you live, work, study, and play. Awake, O sleeper. Paul gives us another, a second warning to the Ephesians and even to our church today. Warning number two is we're in a spiritual battle. Whether we like it or not, it's a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10, says this, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Okay, notice he didn't say government rulers. (laughs) It's evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world. Against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I heard it once said, the world is at war and the church is Well, the church is holding a picnic at Normandy on D-Day. That's often how the world sees the church. That should break our heart. We should be praying and seeking to save the lost. But this requires us to make another shift, and that's a shift from more strategy to more surrender. You know, I'm a person who likes processes. I'm a person who likes strategies. Yet when we spend all of our time creating programs to meet a process, and we don't think about the people who we are ministering to. We don't think about the people that we're missing. We don't think about the people that walk by, drive by our church every single week and never step foot in. We seek to create worship services for my preference or a church that I like and not looking at how people outside the church experience it. You know... Sometimes take things for granted. You know, how many times do you walk in and notice the church carpet? (laughs) How many times do you walk in and notice the light bulbs that are out? Simple things that sometimes we miss. Yet a brand new guest sees every single bit of it. If we surrender ourselves, our preference, and our style to God, He will break our heart for those around us. He will begin to teach us that we can worship anytime, anywhere, any place. As I really believe that I hope you, well, I pray He's been doing in your lives during this time that you've learned maybe even more what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. You know, I I had to throw in here a story. I wasn't planning on it, but there was a, a gentleman, I think I've shared this before, but a gentleman in our last church, Carlton Goodhand. Carlton was born about the time the church was started. Carlton was one of the saints of the church. Very well looked up to and loved. And every time the church did something new, whether it be to put black behind the preacher so the live stream could pick him up better with the lights, whether it was to add some lights to the stage, Maybe it was to add a a drum cage. All those different things and live drums. Every single time, Carlton, who generally sat in the back on that right-hand side about three-quarters of the way back in a church in an auditorium that said about 600, every time we would do that, Carlton would move to the front two rows. And while we were worshiping, he would raise his hands and he would let everybody in that church see that he was in agreement with what God was doing in that church. 
even when he didn't agree with the music, even when he didn't agree with the changes, because, well, it wasn't the way he liked it, but he wanted people to see that he didn't care what he liked. He wanted them to see that God was praised and glorified. And let me tell you, we noticed as a pastoral staff, it was so encouraging to see someone who was a saint of that church, who could have done more to try to divide, to be divisive, and gossip and slander, and he was there. Carlton taught me what it meant to never let my preferences get in the way. And I pray that I will always be that way. That even when I'm old, in cantankerous, I will never let my preferences get in the way of what God is doing. But in order for us to get there, we must be honest about the systems in our church. Systems that oppress and keep people away from God. First, it's a system where the pastor and the people divide. Satan loves to cause divisions. None of us, people nor pastor, are better, smarter, more called, more chosen or blessed, more spiritual than the other. We are all called to simply surrender, to be servants, to understand the grace that we've been given and to seek the God who will break our hearts for those around us. The second system is we need to quit trying to build the church and start building the kingdom. You know, Jesus and Paul never said get bigger. They never said get bigger. They said go. I'm not interested in building a mega church. That's not why we add another service on Sundays at all. We were planning on this before this pandemic started and now it's great because it helps us to come together and still keep better uh, max uh, uh, capacities in each room and allow for more people to come and worship and all of that. But even after all of this is done, we'll still keep it. But it's not so that we can get bigger, but it's so that we can trust God. Because I'm more interested not in building a mega church, not in, not in being a name that's known throughout any denomination because I could care less. Um, I'm interested in surrendering our resources to God for His glory and for His use to build His kingdom. If that looks like, and I've said it before, if that looks like a church plant, then so be it. If that looks like missionary support in a brand new way and we're sending teams every year to the same place to build build churches and schools and going deep in an area, then so be it. If that's supporting local ministries like the Mana Pantry and the Opal House and Maya Foundation, then so be it. We want to be surrendered to what God is doing. Third, we must quit starting new relationships with agendas. Judging people before we know them. For years, the church... And I'm not talking our church, but the church in general, the way the community sees it, is we have put our pet gripes with the culture and the people around us ahead of serving God and being surrendered to Him. Instead of speaking to people with truth and love, because we still speak truth, but we do it in love that restores. We're known for speaking truth with hate. We're known for wanting to be part of the Militia that storms the government ground demanding to be open instead of saying, hey, they never once said we had to stop being the church and going out to our community and our neighbors. And my goodness, have you done that? I could say that again, but thank you. And there's a letter coming out with more information about our, our, our new reality plan. And in there, I list just a handful of the things that you've been doing in our village and in our county that is God-driven. You have been the church. Man, I could go off on that right now. It's just so wonderful, but you've learned to speak truth in love. But when we speak truth with hate, we then wonder why the culture around us becomes so anti-Christian. So anti-Christianity. But when we're rooted, not rooted, and grounded in love, well, we cause them to hate us. We give them all the reason in the world to call us hypocrites. The 
call us that and hate us, not because of what Jesus has done, but because of our attitudes. You know, the fourth thing is we must quit believing the church needs professional people to minister. You know, John Wesley was a huge believer in the equipping of the lay. The the priesthood of all believers, as he put it. The non-clergy. Some are called to spend their lives teaching and preaching, but not all of us. Some, (laughs) Some are called just to go. Where you live, you work, you study and you play. I heard somebody put it this way. We are all called to minister. Some are called to vocational full-time ministry. We are all the church called to go out. I've heard stories of just taking cookies to a neighbor and how that creates a dialogue in a brand new way. That's being the body of Christ and eliminating a system that looks down, that judges Finally, we must quit believing the church is what we do on Sundays. (laughs) The church is not a program. It's not an organization. It's not a country club. It's not a sorority club. It's it's we don't have some Greek letters to make us all cool. And you know, we walk around with a secret handshake. In fact, by the way, New Reality Plan, you're not shaking hands when you come back. Okay, just so you know. All right. Um, No longer will I say give somebody a hug, a high five, or a handshake as much as I want to. Um, And if I slip and say that, you know what I mean, okay? Um, But we are called to be the body of Jesus, going into the darkest corners of society and bringing light and hope and love every day of the week, not just Sundays. You know, I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't speak these things. There might have been something in these five that you're, you're saying ouch instead of amen. Maybe the Holy Spirit is convicting you on somewhere that you've been there or somewhere where you've seen that our church has been there in the past. And if you believe any of those and are stuck in any of those, then you need the Holy Spirit to help make a major shift in your heart right now. You know, we must stop seeing the church as a religious service to the saints and begin to start seeing it as a hospital for the sick. Remember what Jesus said, I didn't come for the well. I came for the unhealthy, for the sick. We are to be a hospital for the sick. But when you're a hospital for the sick, it gets messy. I mean, because, well, people come in that don't look like you. They don't dress like you, and sometimes they don't smell like you. They might come in off of their high just because they just happen to for some reason, be drawn in there by the Holy Spirit. They might come in there smelling like the alcoholic binge that they just got off of because they lost their job. And they're looking for people to look beyond that and to love them. You might have people that come in with crazy piercings and <clears throat> tattoos, right? And we can't look down on them. We are called to be a hospital for the sick, which means that we begin to be okay with messy. We begin to be okay when somebody spills a little coffee on our raggedy, torn up carpet. Because that carpet doesn't mean anything in light of eternity in God's kingdom. We're called to go. We must stop seeing the church as a cruise ship where my needs need to be met Or I'll vote the pastor out or I'll leave and go to another church. And instead, we must see this as a troop assignment and a troop transport. Remember those old songs, Onward Christian Soldier? Sometimes they seemed a little too militaristic, but it's this picture. Not that we are at war with our culture. Not that we are at war with the people around us that are dying. We are that brigade that goes out we go out with the cross on our, on our shoulders signifying that we are in the red cross, right? In a way, we are the ones going out that run out to help them, to help the hurting. We go out fighting the evil one, the spiritual realms, the devil and his dominions, not the culture or the people. 
And when we see it that way, we begin to be able to speak truth with love in the culture. Am I saying that we don't speak up against atrocities like abortion and other things? No. Not at all. We still go out, but we speak truth with love because we see the young lady who doesn't know what to do. Who's living in a life of brokenness. Who doesn't need to be called a murderer. But needs someone to come alongside and lovingly redeem and restore what the enemy has broken in her life. That's what the church does. But only when we're surrendered and listening to the Holy Spirit, speaking wisdom and courage and compassion, all three. My prayer is that we will stop seeing the four walls of our building where we fellowship as being the church. And spending more time blaming others, especially during this time, why we can't meet. Start seeing yourself as the church of Jesus Christ that is called to go where God is moving. Because He is moving. And He is working and He is drawing all men to Him, not to a building. So God, I just lift You up today. Lord, I just am so grateful that we do get to, we, we have a time frame. We know when we get to come back. We know when we can come together to fellowship. But Lord, may this time have taught us that this building is not the church. This building is where the church comes to restore, to redeem, to charge up, and to go out. Lord, may we see that You have called us to some shifts in our lives. Lord, if we're asleep, wake us. May we not be sleepwalking, sleep talking, and sleep churching. May we not be just coming on Sundays, but may we actively be seeking more and more to be transformed by your Holy Spirit who changes us inwardly so that we're different outwardly and corporately, God, that we shine in a city, in our village, in our communities that need to see your love. They wouldn't see us, but they would see you. Lord, may we share Your hope in this time. And God, just because we're getting ready to come back together does not mean the challenge is over. No, we are going, walking into a time where the brokenness from, from anxieties and fears and depressions that have just been compounded through this time are just going to explode possibly even more where brokennesses and marriages that, and, and domestic issues and child abuse and so many things i have I have reached a pit a, a fever pitch lord and talking to so many in our community that are in places that they see that whether it be teachers or the police or or city officials they're seeing that more and more it's time for the church to step up and arise and wake up and reach out to those individuals god we are coming out of a time where being isolated and maybe those anxieties and fears have led, led to even more hidden sins, God. Lord, may we learn once again what it means to be drawn to Your holiness. That it's something that You work out in our hearts when we are willing to say, God, peel back the layers of my heart. Make me more and more like You. And so, Lord, may the church be even more so a missionary group that goes out with the salve that comes from Your anointing, from Your Holy Spirit. The oils of joy, of peace, of love. God, give us wisdom and courage and compassion to know how to go out. Lord, we love You. We praise You. And we look forward to what You are going to do. The great revival that You are bringing in Your nation for Your name's sake, not ours. God, You bring revival, whether it be here, whether it be at the Baptist Church, the United Methodist Church, Eagleville, anywhere, God, may it be Your revival for Your name. And we just want to be a part, even in a small way, God. Direct us. Use us, we pray. And we will give you all the glory. 
and all the praise forever and ever and ever we pray these saints. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Have a wonderful week. And if there's anything we can do or you need, please don't hesitate to let us know.